So our wet plan webinar is brought to you today by our wet plan partners, the Lee County Division of Natural Resources with Maria Romero. We have Pond Watch with Dr. Ernesto Lasso de la Vega. We have Johnson Engineering with Andy Tilton, Karen Miller with GHD, an engineering firm, and me, Marlene Rodak, uh, with the Kokoloba chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society. We're, ex we're very excited to have today's speaker. Uh, Becky Reed is uh, with Lee County Natural Resources. She's a Capital Improvement Projects Manager. She's going to be talking about what or how and when to consider a pond shore restoration. Becky Reed is, is a Capital Improvements Project Manager with Lee County Natural Resources. She's also a licensed Florida professional civil engineer specializing in water resources. Her current position with Lee County allows her the unique ability to safeguard the area's natural and water resources from two fronts. Through the implementation of proposed county water quality and flood mit mitigation projects, and through the review of proposed development projects by private entities. Becky's previous experience includes over 16 years of regulatory compliance with the South Florida Water Management District. While with the district, her compliance duties often included bringing lake banks or pond slopes into compliance through the coordination with HOAs, POAs, CDDs, development, developer consultants and other agencies. Um, and I know I've had some dealings with Becky in the past and um, she's, she's great. I'm really excited to have her here today to um, talk with us and to help us with our stormwater ponds. So with that, I am going to turn the presentation over to Becky. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you for having me here. So today I would like to speak about the pond shore restoration and maintenance. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. There are, um, if you live in Florida, you've seen ponds, you're familiar with them, they're everywhere. Um, there are wet ponds, such as lakes and filter marshes. Here are a couple of lakes. And when people think of lakes, they generally think of a natural system. These are natural systems, however, they serve the purpose of water quality treatment as well and storage and attenuation. So that is an important thing to remember when you're thinking about these lakes. So the filter front marshes, I don't have them pictured. Dry detention ponds. This is a dry pond. Unfortunately, it's not a great picture of a pond, but in the wet season, there will be water in here. And in the dry season, it looks like this. And dry ponds allow the water to infiltrate into the ground for, for um, water quality treatment purposes. So when you're considering maintenance, you want to, first of all, refer to your association documents and your home, homeowners association CDD. They often have, um, some kind of guideline for maintenance requirements that's a part of a county or water management district requirement. Um, they have lake management plans, which can include the maintenance frequency, but it also might include other things like water quality monitoring and um, other sorts of things like that. The maintenance frequency is really dependent upon the pond, but generally you want to have regular inspections. Annual inspections are the minimum, um, preferably before rainy season. So that way you know that your pond is in a good condition to handle the inundation of rain that is about to come for the summer. Um, it's better to check them semi-annually or quarterly, and then that way you can check prior to rainy season, and then maybe once or twice during rainy season and then at the end see what resulted from the additional flows that you don't see from November through May. So 
the only time that agencies that I'm aware of are interested in enforcing the maintenance of lake banks is when there's erosion that is pretty severe. Um, and usually it's triggered by a complaint from a homeowner or um, resident or an inspection in the area that they need to do anyways. So if there is erosion that results in a nine foot high drop, then that is what, when the agencies, at least the water management district would require maintenance on a system. So anything before that is being proactive and um, protecting your property or the community's property. So here is what that looks like. It doesn't, it's from the pictures, it's usually hard to see, but that is nine inches and it doesn't look like much when you're viewing it from afar. Um, but when you step in it by accident, then that, <laughs> then that makes a difference. And um, at that point, the water management district will require repairs. So I have a couple of lake bank examples. Here is a newly established shoreline. And I use lake bank interchangeably with pond shore. I'm more used to saying lake bank, just, as, uh, just so you know. This is a newly constructed shore. You can see that there's sod there and it's lumpy from just being installed and put in. Put in. So this has to establish and take root and it's looking like it's doing that. Here is a shoreline that has healthy littorals and this is years of um, establishment and this is what we like to see. I know that some people see this and think, oh my goodness, there's weeds, but this is actually what protects your lakes and it also helps improve the water quality in the area. And then this shoreline that needs res restoration, it has a steep drop. Even without measuring it, you can see that that is a drop. Um, so that would be something that would require um, fixing and the agencies would step in. So when you're thinking about maintenance, there's some considerations that you want to keep in mind. And that's one of them is the government agency requirements. Here are the Lee County requirements. And when you go from federal to state to county to city, the more localized you get, the more stringent the requirements are. Um, and not all agencies have requirements. Maybe the city doesn't but the water management district definitely does and then the county does. So here the water management district's requirements are the minimum and the county's requirements are what you have to do because you are, are in, you are in that um, boundary, jurisdictional boundary. So for Lee County, and based off of Lee County Land Development Code 10329, a six to one slope is required. And that is six feet horizontal to a one foot drop vertical. And that starts, or that's um, up to two foot below dry season water table. And these slopes are in place for safety reasons. Um, they're actually required by the Water Management District as a safety requirements because that way people can safely es escape the pond if they need to or um, for mowing as well. Um, so the county also requires healthy littoral vegetation, vegetation and that the ponds mimic natural systems and include shade trees. Um, there's specific drainage easement requirements and that those drainage easements are so that the community is able to get equipment in there for maintenance and make these corrections as needed. Um, so oftentimes there are communities that don't have drainage easements because for some reason that wasn't recorded and it makes repairs um, a much harder process to um, make happen. So, um, 
South Florida Water Management District also has requirements, as I discussed. Um, they require a four to one slope. So it's a little bit steeper than the county's requirements. And the county required a steeper slope because they were experienced receiving calls from um, concerned citizens who were having issues with their lake slopes. So the water management district's requirements are four to one and then the pond is set to drain or allow water out of the system at a certain elevation. And from that elevation, one foot above, one vertical foot above and two vertical feet below that elevation is where that slope needs to be. So anywhere outside of that range, a two to one slope is um, what they what is allowed. And um, the same thing applies with the county. Anything um, below that two foot below dry season water table, two to one is allowed. The water management district requires that the slopes be stabilized. They don't necessarily have a littoral vegetation requirement unless there's compensation needed for hardened shorelines or um, bulkheads. And then, as I said, bulkheads, they're allowed for up to 40% of the shoreline length. Um, but Lee County re requires mimicking of natural systems. So this isn't, this isn't something that we encourage, but it is a possibility if you go through permitting and um, ask for that allowance. It's not guaranteed either. Um, and South Florida Water Management District has a 20 foot lake maintenance easement requirement. So check with your local agency in case there are more stringent requirements. So before any maintenance activity happens, the county requires a permit for lake bank restoration. So please keep that in mind because the water management district doesn't. So if you are approached if your association is approached by uh, the water management districts because repairs are needed, they're going to consider it maintenance activity most likely and won't require a permit necessarily, but the county does. So please keep that in mind when you're looking for Lake Bank improvements. So as I said before, safety is an important consideration of Lake Banks. Um, oftentimes there are um, drops that you don't see if small children or people who are weaker um, somehow have gotten into the pond and are trying to get out, that slope is there to help them be able to crawl out if they need to. And then the steeper the slope, the harder it is to mow and maintain the, the vegetation. And there's been pond accidents where mowers have been um, in bad accidents. And unfortunately, that's something that happens when there's steeper slopes and we'd like to prevent that. Um, another concern with why people would wanna keep maintenance in mind is property limits. Um, many homes are built along lake banks and that's because also it's a nice selling feature and the fill from, that's obtained from the lake is used to um, build up the home or the lot. So when these developments happen and over time the pond erodes, sometimes it keeps encroaching back into the homeowner's property until it's outside of the lake easement. And if this hasn't been addressed and repaired throughout the years, there becomes the issue of repairing it outside of a lake easement. And then it gets more complicated to make repairs close to structures and more expensive. And then vegetation, like I said before, People come to Florida and they want to have nice waterfront property, open space, um, and then they see the littorals and view them as weeds. And they are not weeds. They are um, native plants that help 
maintain the lake banks and improve our water quality so that when it goes outside of the system and into our rivers and creeks, we have a um, clearer water, better water quality for the, the plants and animals in those ecosystems. So one thing to think about with vegetation management is often there's communities will have a um, just a lake a lake maintenance lake vegetation maintenance person that comes in quarterly um, to spray and control the amount of vegetation. Uh, you want to make sure that they're not over spraying and um, killing off the littoral banks because once that dies off, it creates an opening for erosion. And if that timing is right, then it can just quickly um, progress from there. And it's much easier and much more cost effective to keep on your maintenance and fix things as needed and pay attention to the system rather than let it go. And then all of a sudden you have tens to hundreds of thousand dollars in maintenance requirements. Um, and then, like I said, you wanna get approvals from the HOA and the, the county water management district, any agency that might need it. And the county does require a permit. Um, usually the association boards are the ones that need to come in for the permits. And um, they are who you want to go to first if there is a lake issue is go to the board and make sure that they are aware of the problem and find out what steps that they are taking to um, remediate it. So earlier I discussed the minimum slopes that are required. Lee County requires a six to one slope and South Florida Water Management District requires a four to one slope with a nine inch drop tolerance. So here you see that line on the control structure. This is a control structure for the lake. Water goes out. There's a probably a three inch bleeder. That's typically what it is, but not necessarily. And at the bottom of the bleeder, this is typically where that water line is, it, depending on how high that water stages. So we're just going to assume for this purpose that this is the control elevation. And from this control elevation, um, we'll, we'll talk about that later, but Lee County requires a six foot to one, six to one slope. So six foot horizontal, one foot vertical drop. And this slope occurs from the top to two foot below the dry season water table. So here where the water line is, we'll assume it's dry season when this picture is taken. This is where you start at the water level and two foot down. So 12 feet across underneath the water horizontally, this needs to be a six to one slope. For the water management district, their, their criteria for the slope is based on the control elevation. And that is a four to one slope. So below water surface, that would be eight foot across and above water, above control elevation, that would be four foot across. And here is the front face of a control structure and what a control elevation would be for this structure. So here are some examples of erosion. This is probably due to a yard drain or some kind of um, irrigation system just by looking at that. This here, you see the drop, it's just, that is probably water fluctuation or or wave action from the wind. So if a community typically gets a specific directional direction of wind, this, like all of the other slopes will be nice and 
smooth and then they'll have one side that has this drop so then if you have that in your community you know that you need to provide more maintenance on this side of the lake and here is a um, lake that the slopes weren't really established well so at any rain event there was this erosion so when this happens you want to try to fill those in before that um, the plants take hold because then once they grow and establish and you don't have that smooth, you don't have that smooth um, four to one or six, well, six to one slope. And people can step in that thinking it's gonna be a smooth slope and injure themselves, twist an ankle. Um, here, this is um, concentrated flows from either a pipe or a yard drain or in between lots. So here are examples of water level fluctuation erosion. You can see the drop here and over here. Here, there's a drop and then there's some littorals. So the plants were able to survive in um, the fluctuation up to this level, but over here, they, they weren't able to and they haven't established um, a, a planting system or, or stabilization to help that, but it looks like they did try to put riprap in between, which is we'll discuss later. And here, this is this is an example of where there's a drop, but it's not at the point where you would want to, where you need to um, perform maintenance or an extreme maintenance event that um, would be triggered by the water management district or another agency. Um, requesting compliance. This one is probably over nine inches and so is this one. So you would definitely be required to fix that and come up with a plan to fix that if someone were to report this or see this and it's a problem. So here is an example of the concentrated runoff between lots. So here's a home, here's a home, you see the roof drain, and it's concentrated here. Usually lots have um, the split drainage where it slopes towards the middle in between the lots and then it goes towards the lake. So here's the close up view from the house looking towards the lake and here's the side view. And here are some yard drain erosion. So what happens here, as you can see, is there is a roof drain that is piped into this yard drain. So it bubbles up and then it just free flows. And this isn't stabilized. So it causes erosion or maybe the excess water also helped destabilize that. Here is another yard drain. This is the pipe outfall is high on the lake bank. So when it's higher than the water level, all of that energy from the water coming out is eroding at the at the ground underneath it. So those are some things that you want to look for. Okay, so we have some restoration methods. There are many options. I don't have all of them by any means here, but um, the typical method that people want to do is just backfill the original material and then if there isn't enough, add some more material as needed. Um, land development code doesn't allow this unless certain parameters are met. So typically, move on to the next option because if you're having um, maintenance issues to where there is a nine inch drop or um, it's it's a freak there's a high concentration of flow you're going to want something more than just backfilling the original material because you will spend less money up front but you will have to keep repairing and keep repairing it and it's not really helpful if you don't have it compacted to what it needs to be 
And here are reinforcement mats. These are coconut mats, I believe. Um, and this is the beginning of the installation. And here, they're still in the process. Here's some littorals that were existing that they kept. And then here are the different species that they planted through the mats. You can see the mat right there. And then they just gradually planted it. That way, the mat helps stabilize the land while these are um, taking root and, and flourishing. So this is the kind of stabilization that you want to see. This is the kind of improvement that you want to make if you have to do an overhaul of your lake slope. And here is another option. Um, it's a geogrid or waffle. Um, that's also an option. But if you don't have the littorals and plantings that help establish it, I mean, this is established, so it still held, but it would hold better if you had these littorals in place. And here is where they used riprap to mitigate their drop. And this is not something that is encouraged. It's prohibited unless approved and you have to request a, a with variance or um, something in order to get that to happen. Um, and usually it's if there isn't a better option. So one of the things that your community can do to help with your lake maintenance is get to know your system, know where the lakes are in the system, how they're connected. That way you know where there could be problems coming in, like where water is going to flow more, where, um, where there's turns, maybe there's steeper slopes. So take a look, find out what that means for your community. These red arrows are where the control structures are in this community. So there are pipes connecting a majority of these lakes. This is the community here. This is not part of it. Um, but these are the final outfalls that take the water either into another basin or out of the system completely. And this community has the water going out of the system into wetlands. So if you're finding that there's problems with your lakes, one of the things you can do is look at where is my um, lake finally outfalling. So if there's your lake seems higher than normal, maybe your control structure is clogged. Here are some different structures that are in a pond. One of them is a, the control structure, which is often a modified type C inlet. So it's this inlet and they modify it by um, putting or orifices in it, which could be rectangular or circular. And here is a weir. Um, these are sometimes in projects, not as often as these. These are the mitered end sections, which is the end of the pipe. So it's the end of the pipe that connects one lake to another lake or one lake to a ditch. This pipe is full of vegetation. So it's not providing the most flow that it can. The capacity is taken up by the vegetation and probably sediment inside of it. Here is a head wall. It's another end of a pipe. And you can see that there is also vegetation obstructing its ability to get water out and earth as well. This is an inlet. This actually looks good. <laughs> so this is where water can go in. And sometimes these inlets are also or function, not also, but function as bubble up structures. It depends on how that is designed. And here is that yard drain we saw earlier. And this yard drain is to pop off roof runoff. So other maintenance that is related to ponds other than just the lake slopes and pond shores are the pipe maintenance and the bottom of the pond if it's a dry pond or if it's a ditch. I think, I believe this is a dry, um, but this should be a little more even and not sure what's going on there. And if you can see, if you look hard, this is actually an inlet. See the great lines there? That inlet is probably not very functional. I mean, you can see water gets there and it doesn't seem to be completely 
flooded, but who knows what that looks like when it's really raining. Here is a picture of a weir that hasn't been maintained in years, it looks like from the growth. So this is the top of the structure in the grate. This is the notch where the water flows, actually probably goes this way into the structure. And if you look closely. Be Becky, excuse yeah. me. Um, sometimes you're cutting out a little bit. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, How often? Uh, not too often, but it was a little bit more this last time on okay. that last picture. This last picture here? Yeah, yeah. This picture is of a control structure with a v-notch that is obstructed with vegetation overgrowth so this structure isn't really functioning it might be holding more water and be great water quality purposes but if you're worried about your lake being too high you'd want to make sure this is maintained and this is the inside of a structure you can see the uh, shadow of the grate. And here you can see, I don't know if you can tell, but it's leaves that are just um, plugging up that circular orifice. So often they're, they can be three inches, they can be different sizes, but they're often three inches and it doesn't take a lot to, to block them sometimes. I mean, it could be a styrofoam cup. So if you don't if your community doesn't check these things, um, it's some problem that could affect your lake. And then depending on um, how it affects your lake, it can also affect your lake slopes. So here are some examples of isolated repairs. This is probably in between lots where there is just a large concentration of flow that probably happens at a fast speed when it's really raining. And most of the lake looks good except for this area. So they did an isolated fix. Same over here. Um, and because it is, they've done it with riprap, that's something that they need to get approval for. Um, it's not something that is allowed because the county and the district considers these hardened shorelines. And these, um, when there's the riprap involved, it doesn't allow as much um, infiltration into the ground. So the water doesn't get back, it just sheet flows off the surface. And with these rocks, the purpose of them is an energy diffuser because it, the water hits these rocks and it breaks up at speed. So. It works for this, but you want to make sure you have the right approvals to do this. So with all that said, um, there is the pond contest. Um, if you have a pond that looks excellent or might need a little help, please enter your pond because um, we're doing a contest. You can either win bragging rights, or you can win a makeover for your pond. And when you get a makeover for your pond, that will improve the aesthetics and the water quality in your pond. So please consider it. Um, but I do want to um, also talk about what the next step is if you're concerned about a pond and your pond doesn't win this makeover. Um, what you do is you contact Oh, sorry, your HOA or your association and see what they can do to get it on their maintenance schedule. And if, if there isn't any action, then you would go to the um, agencies. But usually the HOAs have the ability and the budget to hire um, contractors for the repairs. Um, there are some communities in the area that have recently redone their um, lake slopes. So you can um, contact someone in the county. I'll, I'll put a link on later or provide a link later with um, some names of people who are familiar with that um, because I know that Cross Creek is one of the communities that recently either did or is in the process of um, revitalizing their lake. So they have 
they might have used um, some method that works well, or maybe you can also learn if it didn't work well. Um, and that's something that your homeowners association would want to consider because there's different costs to everything. And sometimes the upfront cost is great, but in the long run, it saves the community. So that's something to think about. So you have the chance for a mini makeover if you want it, just enter your pond. And then here's some useful links. This link is for the county codes related to ponds. And then here are the um, Lee County GIS and Lee County permitting um, websites if you want to look up your community specifically. And for the water management district, this is their website for their rules and, and the GIS tool and how to look up your permit. And I'm open for questions if you have any. Thanks, Becky. That's a great job. Um, if you do have questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself. And uh, of course, you could raise your hand under the reactions button, or uh, we can try to I can read off your question in the chat box. All right. Um, so to just and I'll ask when to get started. Um, Becky, you talked about maintaining the control structures and things. And generally, these HOAs, gated communities and that, we have different organizations. We have a lake ma management company. We have landscapers, um, maybe private landscapers and, and uh, common area landscapers. Who should really be checking these control structures and on what type of schedule would you imagine? Well, typically the HOA would hire the, um, I guess the landscapers would do it unless they have someone specifically doing vegetation maintenance and then they would probably have to ask for that as part of the contract to look at it unless someone within the community lives by a structure and wants to check it out with themselves. And um, I would recommend at least in the beginning and end of rainy season um, to look at this and annually um, for all of it, because uh, it could be as simple as pulling out some weeds um, at the end of rainy season or, and your um, system works much better. You cut out again, Becky, I'm sorry. So, Annually is the minimum that I would recommend. Just, just at the very end, you cut out. I'm sorry. I oh, um, so if someone lives by one of these structures or pipes where they can see it, they can also just check and let their HOA know, hey, um, maybe you want to get the maintenance um, crew out there if it's not something that they that's in their purview to handle. Any, que any other questions? Because I'll keep going. <laughs> I got a question, if I may. Sure. So um, you have mentioned, uh, you have not mentioned another uh, alternative for fixing the erosion on the shoreline, which is the geo tubing. And I don't know if the county is still allows that. And what kind of a permitting you have to accomplish to, in order to do the geo tubing fixing, do you require a permit? Yes, or? definitely a permit is required for the geotubing. And I didn't mention the geotubing because- um, Oh, could, we, could you explain a little bit about what geotubing is for sure, those- Sure, let me know? see if I can go back to one of these slides. And while you're doing that, I, I must say something that one of my pond watchers said very eloquently said, that when if you have respected the littoral shelves, you will not have the problem with erosion. This is like a, a mantra. They got you have to really protect your shoreline with the vegetation, and that's the number one problem. People neglect the littorals, and yes. then you have problems with, with erosion. That is so so true. It really is. Um... 
I want to get a lake bank like that one with the steep slope so that you can see that while I'm talking about the geotubes. So I specifically did not include geotubes because they've there's been a, issues with how it's installed in the past and sometimes they communities have spent a lot of money on getting these ponds fixed and in the end they still have an erosion problem so there has to be there's a specific way that it can be done but it usually isn't done to where okay perfect to where um it fixes the problem so say a, a geotube is ah happens is where there is a like filter fabric type tube that is filled with material of um of the slope like soil um fill material and what they do is they put this tube along the bank fill it with the material and um put the plantings over it so what happens if this is if this erosion is due to wind action or water level fluctuation the water water the force of the water can undermine at the bottom of the tube and just um eat away until the eventually the tube is floating and there's a big undercut where that tube is so a lot of associations have gone with that in the past and then still have had issues. So that is one reason why I did not include it as part of the presentation. So when that happens, do they actually have to go back in and remove the tube and then do some other kind of repair? Yes, they do. E either remove the tube or um, or re situate the tube and um, the way that it's formed. Because if it's one huge tube, that's not as effective as doing multiple tubes that are flatter in like a in a t gradual terrace type um, formation. So, so, and then depends also how deep they go. And so it it just depends on how it's done but it's easier to just do the the matting with the slopes and the littorals because um the contractor did the work and i it depends on what that warranty is or how how you for the community it could be a headache that they don't really want to or need interesting i know that that the community that i live in Mm -hmm. just received uh, uh, several quotes for the geo tubing um, and it was the bottom tube and then the sacrificial tube on top that mm -hmm. they slice open and plant right um, so yeah as long as um you i would with those i would ask them ask to see their past projects and how long that they've been installed how um long they've been established so you could see whether their construction method is is effective oh well and in the same token i have experienced uh pond watch volunteers who have used you tube, and then when it's well implemented by putting after the geotube you put a littoral shelf which will protect the shell the littorals will protect the geotube they, they, mm -hmm. The system can be for years. Right now, I've seen 20 years of, of service on, on one of those geotubes, well implemented, well put in there in the system. So I, I have to say that it's well done, it will last. Yes, you have to do your homework. Correct. And, and what is that well done, Ernesto? Is that littorals instead of the sod that they Both. generally? Okay. Both, yeah. Setting, pumping the, the soil that is in the bottom of the pond, put it in the bag 
in the geotube and then protecting the geotube with littorals in front of them and then having the main maintenance on those littorals because then if you neglect them then you expose the bag by the erosion and then eventually end up with like something called the, the bull nose which is like the black bag showing up and, and that's that's the see the purpose but i have seen places where they have done the correct thing Mm-hmm. is looks still good looking good yes it it is um there there are people who can do it well but um general or in the past i haven't seen many that have so that's why i didn't bring it up but you can find someone who can do it well yes just do your research check check prior projects yes do your research ask other communities. Um, I, I believe um, the University of Central Florida has a um, erosion control um, department and you can even call them and ask for their advice or maybe send them an email. I, do, I don't know what their um, website is, but I've, I've heard about it before. Good. What other questions are out there? Well, I will then, hate to let her go because she's a worth I know. information. And I bring some other question because I encounter this problem. The gutters from the collecting from the from the homes around, they're very short. And some communities uh, developers allow that gutter to be just just enough. Uh, when is the county going to start enforcing? the developers to extend the pipe to go further down because that's what they create those um, scarment. I really don't have an answer for that question, um, but I do understand the concern. Um, I don't think that roof uh, pipe connections are required. So, so it's not something that is really regulated because it could just be an open roof drain with um, the little plastic um, diffu- energy diffuser at the bottom, or you could put um, little stones or plants underneath it. Um, so not all communities have those pipes, but um, if they do, um, it would be nice if they were originally installed correctly. And on in that vein, I just want to uh, address the um, issue of when we, a lot of us have new roofs put on and new gutters or downspouts. And the one thing that all the gutter companies do is they drop that downspout, they output that downspout right onto your driveway if they can. Mm -hmm. Um, And we actually had to call them back and have them redirect it to our yard um, because we didn't want it to go down the driveway. It doesn't, it doesn't really serve the purpose of of uh, trying to slow the water down by putting mm-hmm. it out on under the driveway. So, um, to be clear, I think what Ernesto is saying is, <clears throat> excuse me, my <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is giving out. Um, the pipe that goes directly into the pond is too short versus the gutter downspouts being too short. Yes. Um, Yes, I, I I understood that. It's just we don't. They're not all regulated to be going in to connect to the pond directly. Um, I don't think that's something that we get into that much detail about. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not hard to find erosion issues on about any pond that's been around ten years or more, um, because these erosion issues are just so so prevalent. And, um, and I'm not really sure why people are so opposed to the littoral plants. It, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me because it's so expensive not to have them and not to have a healthy population. It is. And littorals do so much to protect the water. Yeah. I think it's neglecting. Um, it's neglection because they don't want to, they see the plants and they don't, probably see the the purpose of them and later on they understand it's too late 
and then that's that's your the price that you have to pay for neglecting your pond. I have heard or had conversations with residents who don't like them at all because they are weeds. So it also has to do with opinion and maybe education. Or you're showing the bill. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and it sort of takes us back a few months to Dr. Everham's presentation about people are terrified about what's living in that water in Florida, whether there are alligators or snakes or whatever. And, and I think that, that, that a good, healthy littoral zone is almost frightening because it can hide things. Yes, I can understand that. Any other questions, Van? Yes, I have one. Go ahead, Hi. Ken. Um, you know, you talk about all the plants that, that they're beneficial around the shore and everything, but where do you get these plants to put in there? Our, our, all the way around our pond has been killed off by our CDD. They had a guy come in and just spray it and everything is gone now. Okay, now I'm looking to improve that area around the shore. And what do you plant? I mean, to say plants should be put there, but what are they? I will let Marlene answer that. I wasn't sure if you wanted to answer that or not. Um, the county does have certain regulations um, about how densely the littorals do need to be planted. Um, and to me, it's less than minimal. Um, and especially to protect your pond shores, you need to go beyond what is generally required. And, and the requirements have changed over the years, and Becky can address that. But um, I probably the easiest thing to do is to work through your lake management company to replant those littorals. And there are different types of plants that they can get to do that. You could get one inch potted plants, you could get four inch plants, you could get two inch plants, you could get liners. Um, but generally, the lake management company would install those for you and generally mm, would protect would provide some kind of maintenance uh, guarantee on those. Um, and like Ernesto said, you do have to maintain them. You do have to add to them uh, because they tend to be uh, killed by some of the pesticides uh, or herbicides that are sprayed around the pond or uh, the incorrect herbicides being sprayed around the ponds. Um, additionally, I'm kind of jumping onto Becky's territory. Lee County has a fertilizer ordinance that tells you that you can't apply fertilizer within 10 feet of any water body. So grasses tend to need fertilizer. So ideally we'd like to see a buffer zone, a 10 foot buffer zone around the ponds that isn't mowed and would prevent those cuttings from going into the pond. Um, plants actually take up nitrogen and phosphorus out of the water, but when those plants die, that nitrogen and phosphorus is released back into the water, which is counterproductive um, and, and not something we want to do. So any cuttings have to be taken away from the pond, uh, really as far as possible. And I could keep going on and on and on about this, um, but I would say you want your lake management company to go in there and plant those littorals and to guarantee them for a period of time. They should be planted in groupings and you could even get a landscape architect to lay out and plan a really beautiful butterfly garden slash buffer zone that could just be really outstanding with seating areas or whatever. Becky, anything to add? or correct me? Oh, no, that was perfect. Um, and what you might also want to do is make sure in the lake 
maintenance, vegetation maintenance plan that um, there is within the contract, um, the ability to reestablish this if they overkill it. Good point. So make some accountability for the lake management company. Right. Okay, I'm going to come back with the original question. And it is the CDD killed it off. Okay, it's gone. Okay. We've gotten rid of that management company that was doing it. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about getting a having the management company put these plants in. Is, are you saying that these plants are not readily available to like a homeowner like myself? Oh, you could probably um, go to different places to purchase them. Um, I'm not familiar with all of the locations um, other than um, hiring someone and they'll provide it. Um, but I'm sure there are nurseries within the area that do have plants that you can use. And then um, sometimes natural recruitment happens, but you want to make sure that it's the right kind, the native natural that um, recruits naturally. And, and that's a really important point to do only native plants around the water bodies because water really spreads invasive exotics quickly. Um, and Ernesto's had some great successes with some of his pond watchers. Joan Justice was propagating a lot of the plants herself and, and spreading them around the pond. But it's a very long and difficult process. And frankly, most homeowners are not going to step into the water and plant plants into the water. There's just a fear about that. Yes, exactly. In fact, uh, Ken, you can find that video on, on the video section of the web plan website. And also, I'm going to, if you send or send us an email, I can reply to you uh, with a list of different companies in the area that provides plants. I have a list of those. Yeah. And there are some great ones, even just getting dune sunflowers. You know, you can buy a four inch dune sunflower for $2.50, and that plant can spread 10 feet. And, you know, it may come and go a little bit, but overall, you're going to get some really good coverage um, in the upland area uh, that's going to create that 10 foot buffer to your pond and to your littorals. But it's a big job, Ken. It's a really big job. One idea, and I don't know how actually to implement this, but if there is a community that has an excess of littorals and they need to weed it, and weed through it and um, thin it out, maybe you can coordinate with their community. Your community can. And littorals are really easy to grow. You know, you can stick them in, stick potted plants in, in a tray of water even, and they tend to sprout really easily. And, and the seed source is, is really resilient. Um, so generally, even in my own backyard, when they stopped mowing, the littorals started popping up on their own, but they just tend to be mowed and weed whacked to where they can't come back. Did we? answer your question this time, Ken? Uh, Ernesto did. I'll, I'll contact him about where these plants can be purchased or acquired. And uh, I'll work with Ernesto on there. So I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. And we're about out of time. So if there's any last question, Otherwise, we can close up for the year and for a little while. And um, we do encourage you to uh, join the Lee County Pond Competition. Um, and thank you, Becky, for 
a great presentation, very informative. And um, I think that's about it. Anything else, Maria or Ernesto or Becky? No, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's a complicated issue. So um, you really did a nice job touching on a lot of aspects of it. So with that, we'll wish everybody happy holidays and um, we'll sign off. <laughs>